So Seamus, tell me about your geek anticipation things this week. Well, I have a funny story from my wife. My wife was on Reddit this week and there's some thread about, I, I don't remember what group it was on, some support group for some health issue, right? And somebody asked, hmm. hey, what are you listening to these days? And she replied with, I'm listening to the Wombats. And the two songs she was listening to are, If You Ever Leave, I'm Coming With You, and Everything I Love is Going to Die. And she immediately <laughs> got a reply from the system going, It sounds like you might be having some trouble. Are you okay? Here's some links <laughs> no. to some suicide, you know, prevention or some support or whatever. What? No. And No, that's not well, helpful. <laughs> right. But it's just sort of funny that she named two songs and it was worried she was going to do something bad. Irreversible. And, right. And I was like, okay, I understand why people create... Th like, it would be really unsettling if that was created by Reddit itself. But as I understand it, that sort of bot is set up by the people running that community. Hmm. It's still not helpful, though. Right. Like, like if you... There, so, so, like, maybe 20 years ago, there used to be, like, suicide prevention billboards all over the place. You remember those? Uh-huh. Do you know why they took them down? No. I just assumed the internet. I just assumed, like, everything else, the internet replaced them. Well, it turns out that they you can do statistics on suicide, and uh, the places with the suicide prevention billboards had a spike in suicides not a decline so they took them down well because it's it's just basically advertising the idea of killing yourself like oh i guess i could kill myself i see that billboard every day oh maybe i will no that's not what you want that's not what we're trying to do it's the same thing with that automated caring script bot it's like hey have you ever thought about killing yourself it's like what? that's not helpful <laughs> don't tell me that right <laughs> right how interesting um, my worry was, you know, I don't mind that the people that run this community set this up. We can argue about whether or not that's smart or optimal, but at least it's a small community doing that for themselves. I would mm. be very alarmed if this was something that Reddit had running on a global scale. Reporting it to local health officials and all that. Right, exactly. Like, and you know, that's how, like, if they ever did that on Facebook, that's how it would work. They probably do. I mean, if right. it's possible, and, they've probably done it. Right, like, I, I immediately see, okay, I see a person trying to help others. I'm not going to complain about that. Y you're, you're making the case that they're not be that they're not helping in a in a good way. I, I don't feel the need to weigh in on that. I'll just say, okay, I like that this person is trying to help others. But I immediately become incredibly suspicious and go, oh, no, where's this going? As soon as it's done on, like, a system-wide level. Yeah. Your team loses at sports, and suddenly you've got all these antidepressant advertisements everywhere. Oh. So, um, hopefully this isn't a a harbinger of things to come and this is just someone <laughs> trying to be helpful by using automated scripts and probably some probably some python scripts yeah yeah here this python script will fix you right up <laughs> <laughs> you've got some you've got some problems in your life i'm sure there's something that that a computer could easily parse and and solve for you it's just an engineering problem after all right uh although there are some problems that are engineering problems that you can solve with Python. Oh, I've been I've been doing a lot of coding this past week. Uh, you remember I made some scripts for Minecraft uh, in Python years ago, like a decade oh, yeah. now. And uh, so I started working on them again. I put up a GitHub repository and uh, broke out the old code, dusted it off, and tried to you know, get it running again. It turns out it still runs on one point twelve Minecraft one point twelve, but I wanted to get it running on one point eighteen. And uh, so I was I started to edit and and I was just using the the standard Linux text editor or whatever. I was like, you know, this is not this is not great. Like it, it doesn't do automatic white space. It doesn't do indentation, smart indentation. I was like, man, I really need uh, one of those uh, 
what is it, an uh, uh, IDE. I need an integrated development environment. It turns out it's kind of nice, probably. So uh, so yeah. I went and found found an IDE. And, uh, and so this is a story of PyCharm. And um, so just like some background, I've never really used an IDE before. Uh, like all the Python scripting and stuff I did, I did in Notepad, like Windows, Microsoft, Notepad. So it just like really basic one well, and, and idle, you know, the integrated Windows uh, Python IDE, but it's very basic. It doesn't I've have never anything. shopped for furniture. I crafted it all myself. <laughs> right. It's all very small and doesn't have any padding. <laughs> <laughs> Man, this is really uncomfortable. What what modern people use to sit on? So uh, so I I went and got PyCharm and and uh, the first thing I noticed was that there are just so many buttons and menus everywhere. There's just all these interfaces. And I I get the feeling that this is how people feel when they start using Blender for the first time. Um, no argument here. Continue. <laughs> actually, so, but, actually, I I I actually don't think blender's that overwhelming in terms of buttons and fee a hey, blender's problem is that it has a thousand features and most of them are hidden behind hotkeys so you don't even know they're there but oh yeah but then the opposite of that problem you know you you can complain hey all the features are hidden in blender well is it better to have them all in your face, like in Microsoft Word, where like half the <laughs> interface is this giant just sort of tablet of various buttons and symbols and icons and drop yeah. menus? A rainbow palette of tiny icons with all these different inscrutable shapes and geometries. Right. Like the you can find fault with either approach and you know one i can't find features so i don't know they're there and in the other one i can't find features because there are so many i have no <laughs> way of like sorting through this maybe it's just visual noise and yeah the the, the complexity is inescapable <laughs> Right, right. And you'd be really tempted to have like an automated thing, an automated script running that looks at what you're doing and then pops up and says, hey, it looks like you're trying to do this thing. I'm the Microsoft clip pad oh, or whatever. No. <laughs> right. It's like, that seems like such a good idea. Can you imagine the, the monkey head in Blender popping up? <laughs> looks like you're trying Suzanne. to delete the default. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like you're trying to de delete the de delete the default cube. I can I can reset up your default scene so that it doesn't have a default cube in it anymore. Oh no! I could probably write a script like that. Actually, that would be terrible. <laughs> right. <laughs> so so I I appreciate that they don't have a, a little paperclip that pops up and tells me how to write a letter to grandma. Um, but it was kind of it was kind of overwhelming at first. And uh, so I was, I was trying to get, so I, I put these scripts, I designed the scripts to work on files in the Minecraft save folder. And so I downloaded the scripts, I downloaded you know, like GitHub for desktop, for Linux desktop or something, and had it create a repository, but it's like, hey, you can't create a repository where there are already folders in it. That's madness. And so I'm like, okay, fine. I made a separate folder so it doesn't have folders in it and create a repository there. And then I told... PyCharm, the IDE, to go over there and like get the files. And it's like, I don't know what folder you're talking about. I, I can't find it. And I was like, what? How can that, how can you not find a folder? Like what? And so it turns out it's in, I, I actually, turns out is the wrong, the wrong phrase, but just like I gave up because I couldn't figure out. And so I tried to open the files in another text editor and that text editor has like a different file browsing menu and it also couldn't find the folder. It's like in it's like in tilde slash or something, and then the other ones couldn't find tilde slash, or it, it found like, I, I was like my home directory and then dot this and then dot app, and it could find that folder, but the, the, but the folders in the folder that it found were different from the folders in the folder that I was working in. And so it was like, wait, and I, I had both of them showing hidden files. So I feel like they were in like parallel directory structures somewhere. I, I, it was just baffling to me. I couldn't figure out how to get it to get to the files that I wanted it to get to. And it was just so 
so crazy because it's like here's this super powerful tool but it can't browse the file system properly and i don't is that like a problem with the ide or a problem with linux or the problem right? with with uh like you don't even know where to look or which of these three pillars you you need to be searching for a solution oh you need to go into linux yeah. and change this or you need to go, go into pycharm and, and change this or you need to go. Or maybe it's your... a problem with Git that Git has some sort of magical right. directory hiding things so that nothing else can mess with its its repositories. I don't know. I've also I have to look up every time I create a local repository using Git. Um, I have the same problem. Yeah, I used to use what was it, Tortoise, which was a front end from, mm -hmm. from Tortoise Material. SVN. Yeah, yeah, and it's like two different names but for the same system is very confusing okay so it was like the tool is tortoise the system is mercurial and it was on github <laughs> and well svn <laughs> is the is the base versioning system for for that so like mercurial is running a, a branch of svn and then tortoise is the is the like the front end on your computer or something right but like I'd be trying to use that and I just, in the old days, oh no, no, I was using it on Bitbucket. That's the name of the site I was using. And mm. and I was using Tortoise and it was absolutely fine. I could create a repository anywhere I wanted. I'm like, hey, this folder is now a repository. And it's like, okay, chief, it is. And I can version the stuff in there and it doesn't care if this is, this could be a Blender directory or my website or a C project or a C sharp project, you know, uh, Unity. It doesn't care. Whatever. Mm -hmm. You want to mm -hmm. version the files in here. No problem. I got it covered. You can version and branch and merge and whatever. And then, and then the demographics of it went against me and Git absolutely destroyed um, Mercurial. Like 98% of all repositories were Git. And mm. so Bitbucket just dropped support for Mercurial, if I'm saying that right. So, um, and since then I've never been able, I, I like have the worst time trying to get a repository going. I installed all the, you know, all the Git stuff and it just never makes any sense to me. Like, why, why can't I create it here? Why, why don't I have the, uh, wait, it let, it says there already is one here, but there's no files here. What? But I just want to check. I put some files here. Why can't I check them in? No, it it doesn't recognize that they're in there. But then how do you tell it about the file? I don't know. I, what do you want from me? <laughs> yeah, I, I I don't have a handle on it either. Because I the way that I got my files up was I went to github.ui or whatever, .com, and clicked the upload files button. And it's like, okay the normal way to do this is blah, 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 blah. And you enter this command line, blah, blah, blah. But here's a box that you can drop your files in. I'm like, cool, I'm going to drop my box in the file because I don't care about your quote, normal way, unquote. And uh, so I got them up there that way. And then I was trying to get it to download. So so finally I gave up and I just told PyCharm, like, hey, PyCharm, you've got Git integration, right? And it's like, yep, we got Git integration. And I was like, okay, you download the repository. You put it where you want it. Where do you want it? Just tell me. And I'll go there instead. And so that's what I'm doing now. Right. I'm just going to the PyCharm project folder directory or whatever. And somewhere on my hard drive is this old abandoned GitHub repository that's in a hidden folder that nobody else can find. And so that's there forever, I guess. Right. That was the other thing with Git is that it was command line based, which is, and everybody that loves Git tells you how awesome it is because, oh, you just type yes. in this really short command. It's no effort at all. And I'm like, well, I was using Mercurial. I just right-clicked on the folder and said, check in. That's even yeah. shorter. <laughs> that was even, I don't have to memorize any command. Right-click, check this in. And then you type your description and boom, you're done. And you have, you know, you have like a text editor window. So you're not typing your commit message into a command line. You've got like a yes. nice text editing window where you have like even spell check and stuff because there is nothing that makes me crazy. Like realizing 
two versions ago, I misspelled something in one of my commit messages. Yes, and it's, just and it's there, there forever. 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 You, you can't, can't fix it, it unless you want to unless you want to roll back all and then reapply all those changes. Which uh, would just be a nightmare. Oh. Just to fix, you know, like I left out a letter in a word. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I try not to think too hard about my commit messages. Right. Oh, you can just say, like, you do not want to have 50 commit messages that are all like minor changes, bug fixes, code mm -hmm. cleanup. And it's like, but that's a lot of stuff I do. Well, okay, at least like summarize what area of the code I was working on. So I have a hope of finding this later. But yeah. yeah it, it's easy to just sit I, there. I and assuage like, my I assuage my guilt by making one major feature change and then doing a bunch of bug fixes in the background, and then it's like, oh, major feature update, blah blah blah, commit. Right. Major code cleanup, which is just like you know, I had a bunch of extra code that I'd copy and past pasted, pasted, copy from Stack Over from Stack Overflow, and it's like, oh yeah, I didn't need any of that, and I deleted it. <laughs> it's like major yes. code cleanup. Like, if, uh, if you yeah. follow the messages, you would assume, you, you never have a message of, like, major code in messening. Oh, I put a bunch of crap in here. <laughs> I, I, I deliberately shuffled a bunch of stuff around and now it makes no damn sense. No. So, <laughs> if you read the messages, you would assume at some point you reach this state of zero entropy where everything is in perfect organiza organizational harmony. And no, actually, every time you add a feature, you're, like, adding all of this chaos. Yeah. And then you have several yeah, changes. I'm in the, several following changes. I'm in the middle of doing that where it's, like, half of my commit messages are, like, added this feature, did not test. <laughs> I don't want to we'll know if it works or not. I'm going to bed. We'll test after deployment. <laughs> Just like, you know, like I have to commit at some point. I can't test everything before I commit it. And I've, I'm here. Here's where I am. Get and it's fine because no one ever looks at the rest of my code. Like th I'm the only one this is for. But you know, right. it, it feels kind of goofy to be like, well, I didn't test this thing. That so so back in the day, ten years ago, when I was uh, developing scripts and releasing them on the uh, Minecraft forums or whatever. Um, there was someone who requested a feature and I was at work working ostensibly and they're like, Hey, can you make this feature? And I was like, Oh, I know exactly how to do that. And so I went into my, went into my web browser control panel and edited the, the Python file directly as text in the browser and didn't test it, didn't download it, didn't check it for syntax, anything. I was just like, I know this is going to work, saved it, uploaded it. It was already uploaded, right? I was like editing it live on the web server. And then I <laughs> made a little post and I'm like, hey, uh, here's the updates for you, you know, the version thing or whatever. Uh, I didn't test it, but it should be fine. <laughs> 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 and, you know, and went back to actually getting work done. And then at the end of the day, I went home and I'm like, oh man, I really should test that. And so I, uh, I tested it out and it turns out it was fine. It was perfect. Legend. Legend. Feels so good. I'm proud of that moment. Yeah, I know. It only happened once in my whole life. So so anyway, I, I was trying to get this thing running and I, I wanted to open these files. I already had these Python files. I'm like, hey, just open the file. But it doesn't have a button for open file. It's got like create a new project and like create a new enterprise zone or whatever. And then like open an existing... <laughs> Start a new company. Launch right, new yeah. Launch IT like, department. Yeah, integrate uh, solutions from the World Wide Web ecosystem you know, it's got all these like the community community contributions project or whatever. And I was just like, what? where do I open a file? Can you open begin, files here? Can I speak to the proprietor? Study. Yeah. Open begin, market evaluation. D do ecological impact survey. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. So it, so I finally discovered. I was just like, well, I guess open a project. I guess and it turns out that you can open individual files from the open project menu, and so that that works fine. Um, but it's like it doesn't want to be working on individual files. It wants to be managing your project for you, and it's just like, eh, it feels bad. Yeah. And so then I was working on some of the code, and I. I was trying to get a Python interpreter running just so I could like type in some test code, you know, just like to see what it did, you know, make sure I was remembering the syntax properly. 
and uh, I open up the Python interpreter and it's it gives me some sort of weird error message about like the system path isn't updated for the Python interpreter and so you can't run an interactive Python interpreter right now or something. And I was just like, really? Come on. Like, this is all you do. This is an IDE for Python and you don't have a working Python interpreter? Like, what kind of a joke <laughs> is this? <laughs> or if there is one and you don't know how to find it? Yeah, it's like, you know, solve the puzzle to figure out how to turn on the feature that is the normal thing that you're trying to do. So, so Python IDEs, IDEs in general, just, you know, like the entire idea of an IDE is the worst. It's just the worst. Um, they, but they, uh, it turns out that they're also the best. They're so yeah. good. It's so nice to have a Python IDE. Did you know that you can set a dynamic breakpoint and see the values of all of the variables yeah. in your program while it's running? Yeah. yeah, it's pretty magical. Did you know that you can like interrupt execution and just like continue execution and like interact with it directly from an integrated Python interpreter? Yep. It, the best feature is is the most for me, the best feature in the world is is the one that is the most trivial is just color coded text editing. Oh yes, um, syntax it, highlighting. And syntax that is just so magical. You you immediately can see oh, you know, you forget a parenthesis and you can immediately everything's wonky. Why is everything the wrong color? You don't have to compile like you can see it happen when it happens. You don't write 50 lines of code and somewhere on line three you forgot a, an open curly brace and now yeah. and now you can't find it. You just know the compiler is really unhappy with mismatched curly braces but now you've got to go you can visually see where the problem starts instantly. Yeah, yeah. And it does it does PEP8, which is like the Python style guide. It does automatic PEP8 in, in uh, suggestions. So like you can write your whole program as like a single line of code or whatever and have like a bunch of weird separators, but it's not recommended. And so when you make a mistake like that where you didn't intend to leave out the curly brace, but it's technically allowed, you could just like have the whole program inside a curly brace and then run an exec on the whole code block or something crazy. But it'll make the suggestions like it looks like you left out the semicolon here did you mean right. to do that if not like here's where you can fix it and it's just like oh thank you thank you so much i know i'm technically allowed to not use any semicolons but like i appreciate that you pointed it out to me that i made an obvious error it is nice and like john blow has has talked in the past about how awful ides are but i think there's this magic threshold like once you get a working ide the temptation as the author of that IDE is to make it do more. We can help you find your file. It can do all that. It can manage your projects for you. It can manage your solution for you. And they keep, it's almost like object oriented programming where you have these larger and larger and increasingly abstract structures of stuff that you don't even know what it's all for. What is a solution and how is that different from a project and how is that different from like just this program? So like a I've module got and then it's right. got files in it and each of the files has functions that are classes and there are module classes and, and parameter classes and yeah, yeah. And it probably makes a lot of sense if you're doing something on an enterprise level. Okay, here we've got, you know, we're maintaining this program plus its DLLs, which stop making DLLs. You're evil. Just <laughs> statically link everything, you you bastards. What are you what are you trying to save hard drive space here in 2020? Uh. Uh, but you know, here we've got a we've got the program, we've got the Windows version, we've got the Mac version, we've got the Linux version, we've got these DLLs, and they're all part of the same sort of thing product that our company makes and then we've got the same group of engineers work yeah but yeah then... and we've got all the all the mimics in there and all the coral and it's all just part of one giant messy thing right and me and then you open up this same program and all you want to do is make your little minecraft script and you're like what is all of this yes what is yeah it's just fractal 
this fractal hierarchy stretching off into an infinity of like containers of containers of containers. Yeah, this is this 80s neon abstract landscape. Like uh, the girl from Jurassic Park. This is Unix. I know this. <laughs> <laughs> it's this VR thing. It's this VR horror uh, show. Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, to be fair, PyCharm is not actually that bad. It's it's a little bit weird getting into just because of the the quirks of any large piece of powerful software. Um, but on the whole, I've been very happy with it. And it's working great as long as I you know stay inside the guide rails and don't try to do anything crazy like you know right. browsing to a directory or whatever. The one thing I've never been foolish enough to try. I knew this was a bad idea. Every IDE I've ever used is like, oh, you know. Hook hook me up to your to your source code control system, so that from within the IDE you can use hotkeys to like submit code, and like you know do commits. Oh no! And I always knew that's that what I'm just... that's what I'm doing now. Oh, you that's actually how I got integrated it. To work. it. Yeah, oh. I I told it to I gave it my password and told it to just download the Git repository itself, and now it's managing all of my commits. I've never I've never done that. Um just because I always assumed it would be a night like oh great I'll install this on a new computer and then that computer will have no idea how to connect to this system and I'll have to figure out how to connect the two of them together again but if I yeah. don't do it exactly the same way then it won't work so I've always kept them separate hmm. I always assumed well, it. I mean, maybe, I mean maybe it works great it's working okay for me assumed. in this IDE in this application but who knows I never tried to move it to another computer so far so <laughs> i'm sure it's nothing to worry about and it will never be a problem in the future oh good uh another thing that i really love about it is that it's got the um like it can find all the variables you're not using and it'll be like hey you declared this variable but you never used it do you want to just delete it and it's like yes thank you i i was trying something there and it didn't work out but i'm glad you noticed that i don't need that anymore or like, you know, you declare this variable twice and this first declaration is is just overwritten immediately. Like, do you want that to go away? Oh yeah. And that, just like that, stuff like that. That's important. The when I'm programming in C and C, that stuff gets really annoying because um Visual Studio kind of does this live compile in the background. So like I type a variable name and it immediately gets underlined in red. And I see a message at the bottom. Hey, you've got a variable you're not using. And I'm like, hold your horses, dude. I just created it. <laughs> like, let me press the purpose. return button. <laughs> let me go to the next it's line. Checking and for I'll typos use it. as you're writing the words. Like, oh, that's a typo. That's a typo. That's a typo. Okay, that's a real word. No, it's a typo again. <laughs> right, exactly. I mean, you joke, but that's almost what it's like. It seems to like pause. Like, six seconds of no typing and it does its little thing that that's what i i'm not sure if that's the real rule but that's what it feels like so i stop to think and then all these messages of like hey you're not using a variable hey this function's never called and it's like oh whoa, 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 whoa. let me finish writing it here <laughs> if you're so smart you write my function for me right no wait <laughs> please stop no stop on. it looks like you might be having trouble and feeling sad. Do you want some resources? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, speaking of uh, software that's very friendly and inviting, I played Book of Travels this week. It's a game on Steam. I'm not sure where else you can get it, but it's supposedly an MMO and it's really pretty. Um, and I'd like to talk about it. Have you, have you seen or, or heard about Book of Travels? I know nothing about it. I'm Googling it now while you tell me about it. So I think the reason that I had it on my wish list, it went on sale and so I picked it up. Um, it, I think the reason I had it on my wish list was because Arvind, or Arvid, Arvid is the main UI designer. And so I think I heard about it somehow from his social media or something. Um, Arvind, who worked on Good Robot with me? I believe so. I believe it's the same guy. Huh. Uh, cause he work, he is the proprietor of Pyrodactyl, but I see this is from Might and Delight, but who knows, maybe he's moved on. 
he's a smart guy and he's got lots of talents and maybe he's working for somebody else now. I don't know. I haven't caught up with him in over in over a year. Well, um, whoever's doing the UI for them is doing a pretty good job. It's it's kind of a weird, um, it was an, not weird, but it's like an unusual experience. It's the whole thing is it feels. Uh, how does it feel? It's like it's it's um, maybe feminine is the is the main word. Like it's not a masculine experience. Like so many games are like fighting and big brawly guys and like scantily clad ladies and like masculine focused target audience. And um, this feels much more right, right, awesome stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good times. <laughs> but but like this feels much more feminine. And it was it was interesting. Like just like the the entire mise en scène of the 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 whole game is just very different and uh and so i i was having an interesting time playing it i i'm not quite sure what it's trying to do or to be though like because the the whole um the whole memeplex of the masculine game is like you want to be the biggest toughest strongest coolest guy and get all the ladies like that's and you understand that in, intensely and immediately. It's like, okay, I get what, what you were trying to do here. I, I understand the goal. Like, I understand what kind of things I'm going to be doing and why I'm going to be doing them. I, I've always described it thus. I want to be the biggest badass. And I want to live in a world where being the biggest badass will let me solve important problems. Because, like, <laughs> yes, in our world, right. in our world, like, I could, you could give me all the powers of batman right now and what the hell would i do drive around town <laughs> do in with my this? what am i gonna do i can't you can't actually fix society's problems by punching people in the face but i would love to be empowered to be able to do that face punching and i would like to live in a world where after i have thoroughly punched this guys in the face the world is somehow better and i have made people safer <laughs> and and clearly more and objectively and visibly improved right as opposed to just keeping the people in the em emergency room employed <laughs> right yeah yeah oh yeah that's so true so so like this game is not trying to do that but as a result i don't really know what it is trying to do like it's so weird it, it's clearly intentional but I don't know what its intent is. And so I, I played it for about an hour and a half and uh, I walked around kind of slowly and, and picked some flowers and like had some tea, had some nice conversations. Um, I don't know if I'm making progress though. Like, I don't know if I'm, am I doing it right? How, what's my score? How many gold points do I have? <laughs> like what, how do I know if I'm doing it right or not? And maybe that's the point. Maybe it's like any way you want to play is fine and you can just do whatever you want. But like, I can already do that in real life. I can pick flowers and have nice conversations and tea in real life. Like I don't need a video game to do those things. So I'm just not sure. I'm just not sure what it's trying to do. So if anyone in the comments would like to tell me, um, just say like, Paul, here's, here's the deal. You're totally missing it. You're, your autism is flaring up and you just need to, you know, this is the thing you need to recognize. You need to put some autism cream on that and just, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah. So yeah. like I'm watching the very first trailer on steam and it has been a solid two minutes of scrolling over the map with a woman's voice talking. Now I've had it turned down so that I could hear you. So I just hear this murmur of a woman talking in the background while scrolling over a map with place called the forest of four, the verve. I mean, okay. It, it's, it's a map made entirely of indie rock band names. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the visuals are very nice and they're well integrated. Oh, they're, they're gorgeous. And, you know, stylish. Um, um I, yeah. So I, I felt kind of immersed in the game. So here's here's just like one example of like, I'm not quite sure what's going on with this game. So I met a guy and he's like, oh, you look like you could use some help. You want me to call social services? No, he didn't say that. It, it, you know, you should <laughs> go to the... Is this a real guy or is this a <laughs> NPC? I, I don't know. How would I know? <laughs> I think it was an NPC though. I what think it was an NPC because I <laughs> did and took his stuff. <laughs> 
I, I don't have any tools to to inject text into the game. It's all like emotes and and like emojis and stuff. So uh, I don't I don't think it was a PC. I think it was an NPC. Um, so but he told me like, hey, go like southeast and and you'll see this railroad or whatever and follow it to this town or whatever. And uh, so I'm like, okay, cool. Um, what direction is southeast? And in this world, like I have just gotten off of a boat in, in an unfamiliar place. So like, and it's it's not like a sunny day. It's all cloudy. It, in fact, it's nighttime. So like it's nighttime and I just got off a boat. I'm disoriented. Like I don't have a compass on me. How would I know what direction southeast is? And I'm talking to this oh, guy. Wow. Like he should just point. He should just be pointing in the direction that I should be going. Now, now it turns out that the game is like up is north and it's fixed camera orientation so you oh, can't okay. get disoriented but like i don't feel immersed in the game using my knowledge of video games to tell what this guy is telling me to do like it's just it was sort of a weird thing where i was like my character wouldn't know what direction southeast is and oh, right and the the guy in the game isn't like indicating anything and he didn't put anything on my map like i've got a map and i know where all these different places are but like he didn't he didn't say like go to thing and then like it brings up the map and it highlights the thing on the map like that would make sense because then he could be like hey look i'm showing you on the map or i'm just describing it to you and it, you abstract the way into the map he just like tells me the compass direction and so i bring up the map and the map doesn't have a compass rose on it so i have to like infer using my own knowledge that up is north and you know southeast is right and down like but there's it was just very strange it was like it was trying to be too immersive while at the same time like not acknowledging the things that the characters in the game would actually know it was kept this like mixed up kind of too integrated experience well it, it might help you to learn i or to hear i just watched uh another trailer and in the trailer it does show one character hitting another character with a stick and knocking them okay. over and moving on so maybe maybe there is combat oh it might not be a yeah, stick that might be a sword is is the point to never engage in combat is the point to engage in combat and lose like it could be anything <laughs> could be anything and then I'm, I'm i know i'm gonna download this and fire it up and the first guy i meet he's just gonna ask me to bring him 10 boar asses <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, yeah, I, I haven't got any fetch quests yet, or none that I recognized. Like it's it's so strange. It's not it's not strange in a bad way. It's just strange in a foreign way. Like it it feels like a very foreign video game. Like a like a video game made. And maybe it is. Is it made in India? Maybe it's made in India by people from India or something. Like it just. But it's all in English. Like it's so it's so weird because because as a character in the world i should as a character my character should be familiar with the customs and and forms and methods by which people communicate their desire to each other like i want this thing i want you to do this thing the, the character should already have a working embodied knowledge of all that stuff and so as a player i should be directing the the character but i feel like this game is like asking me to become involved in the world and to like understand all of its customs and its history and stuff and and like character creation is very involved and it's got all this stuff about role playing and like your your all the different aspects of your personality and and but like i don't i don't know who this person is like i i can read a book about them but reading a biography isn't the same as actually being that person and so it's it's just it's kind of a weird maybe they're attempting something that's too difficult or 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 that they haven't attained yet because this game is still in development so of course it's possible that like they're trying to do something they're laying the groundwork for it and they just haven't got to the part where it all comes together but it's a very it's a very foreign kind of really alienating experience despite being very welcoming like it's a very welcoming game but the experience of playing it just felt very alienating interesting oh this is by the same team that made shelter Shelter is a game where you're a mother cub taking care of, or you're a mother badger taking care of her cubs. I saw this years ago. It was on my wish list for a while, but then I, I don't even remember why I took it off my wish list. But 
So I've heard of this studio before. How interesting. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It is an interesting game. All right. Let's say we do some mailbags. Yeah. Dear DieCast, listening to great video game scores got me wondering, what would Seamus and Paul think are the best games when it comes to their sound design, scores, and the alchemical result of their fusion with the visual design, gameplay, and or the game subject matter? Um, and then they, this person has some suggestions. I will not pollute the conversation with their suggestions, just so that we, we don't necessarily follow their same line of thinking and we go off on our own. Any games that stand out as particularly impressive or be bewilderingly incongruous to you in these areas? All the best, Andrew. So, do you have any games that you think are notable in the area of sound design or score? Uh, Prison Architect, I think, has a really well put together soundscape system where it's got music that fades in and out and like different tracks of music based on what's happening and it's got environmental sounds. And despite being a very cartoony kind of uh, visual experience, the sound really draws you into the place. It feels like you're really there. And so uh, I think Prison Architect did a really great job of that. Um, I think uh, this is an area where um, survival horror ha games have to be strong, especially mm. real survival horror, not today's, you know, gory combat game. Like, it's Batman, except when you fight stuff, it turns into blood. But, yeah. you know, gory but where, empowerment fantasy. Exactly. And that's a lot of them are uh, Dead Space being the, the main example of this is not scary. I feel totally safe. I am loaded with guns. I have never felt more safe. <laughs> right. I am loaded with guns and surrounded by creatures that are vulnerable to bullets. <laughs> um, I can solve this problem. <laughs> right, exactly. It, um, an interesting choice. I've always thought a fascinating choice was in Silent Hill 2. And I think the other, yeah, the other Silent Hill games, but especially in 2, it telegraphs monsters being near. Now, that sounds like that would be a terrible decision. It's supposed to be a game about scaring you. Um, so why is it telegraphing that a monster, wouldn't it be more scary if the monster just came out of nowhere? And you didn't know you were about to be in a fight. But no, hearing the sound, it's static on the radio, by the way, if you've never played the game. Mm -hmm. you, you have a radio in your pocket, and it just, when a monster's near, it begins like this screechy static noise. Like, like I guess, just monsters generate this really noisy EM field. <laughs> um but it telegraphs, so you hear this sound and it's kind of quiet and you hear it getting louder and louder and you know danger is coming and you begin frantically looking around for it. Um, that helps in that it actually really sucks if in a lot of these games, if you get blindsided by the monster, especially in games with like tank controls, by the time you get turned around, by the time you pilot your forklift person into a position where you can fight this monster, you're <laughs> nearly dead. Right. And that doesn't feel very immersive. Like, I'm a human being. I know how fast human beings can turn. And it's faster than forklift. Right. And so, this isn't a skid steer. Right. And so it just feels wrong and awful. And instead of being scared of the monster, I'm frustrated with the controls. But when it's telegraphed ahead of time, I'm very likely to be looking around frantically and I will have several seconds of anticipation before the fight begins because once the fight begins it's all muscle memory right mm. the the anticipation is where the fear really happens more so like a jump scare is just that quarter second of of time but dread can last quite a bit of time building up to a fight you know is coming and right. I to me, that's what always made Silent Hill so much more powerful than its contemporaries. Um, bad sound design, I would say, is Skyrim. Okay, I know the 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 Dragonborn song is boss as hell. Okay, that's great. But, like, <laughs> Skyrim is so mute. There is so little to that soundscape. Um, one of the first mods I download is just something to make it so that caves have echoing wind howling through them and 
dripping water and forests have creaking trees and wood and bird calls because otherwise it's just like the whole world just are my speakers on <laughs> like, right, right i'm not hearing anything <laughs> this isn't what it's like to be outside i'm familiar right. with it enough to know right and so i've always thought the audio design in skyrim was actually pretty terrible and opposite that would be um half-life 2 which is amazing every area seemed to have its own voice mm. from the the dripping of the the canals to to um like the windswept highlands echo. along the highway yeah. and and the echoing of nova prospect like wow you just feel like all the sounds bouncing around inside of that prison the sound of dr mm. breen's announcement as you as you enter nova prospect and the way it kind yeah. of echoes around in there so amazing mm. soma that's an interesting one i saw you type that into the document here i can't remember I, i'm not saying that i it's not memorable i just i'm not remembering soma i think i think it was on spoiler warning and josh was playing it but I remember that the sound design was, it seemed pretty good. Like it had, uh, it had a lot of ramp up when you're near the weird um, horror monsters or whatever. And, uh, you know, all the underwater sounds when you've got your helmet on and stuff. It sounds like being in a scuba tank or whatever. Huh. I've evidently forgotten a lot of that game. A lot of the underwater games are, are pretty good just because it's not too tricky to make something sound like it's underwater. Like there are some filters you can run all the sounds through right. to make it sound like you're underwater right so like right um, just a big old subnautica filter is yeah yeah subnautica works really well you know you add some breathing sounds and it's like you're set but it's like it's really effective and it gives you that feeling of being you know underwater so uh a lot of those games are, are really good i think minecraft probably has pretty bad sound design honestly like oh it, i have it's to not, agree it's not impressive um it's no, got it's some very nice tunes but the music doesn't really fit the like the scene very well. I, I don't think it's I think it's just like it plays some random song and then, you know, at, at dawn and at dusk it plays a random song or whatever. And then like the, there's no there's no cave sounds, there's no reverb, there's nothing environmental. There's right. monsters, oh. but and but like there's no attenuation for hearing them through walls and stuff. So like you could be in a cave and like, oh, I hear a zombie. Is he in this cave or is he in the next cave over? Who knows? Yeah, I, I would agree. Minecraft is generally terrible. Well, the, the shame of it is Minecraft and Skyrim are very similar. And I can forgive it in Minecraft, which is pro a proc gen indie project. And it is much less forgivable in handcrafted AAA Skyrim to have mm -hmm. sounds like I can't tell how far away this person is. Or I can tell how far away they are but they're not attenuated. Oh, you're on the other side of a door or, oh my goodness, we're in this giant hall and our voices are echoing everywhere or we're in a very close space. Yeah, it's just like Minecraft. It's just mm. sound is sound and walls don't have no effect on it. Dear Diecast, with all the hardware shortages and no end in sight, do you think the big studios will have to start reining in their bloated game dev costs? How can they afford to keep making a HD++ game when nobody has the hardware to run them. Sincerely, Craptop user and late-gen adopter. And, uh, thank you, Mr. User. And, dear Diecast, between crypto mining and certain global crises, the price of graphics hardware is currently rather high, and the same goes for RAM. Between the high costs of the opaque naming schemes, I feel like building your own gaming hardware is not very accessible. Do you think this will cause PC gaming to lose out in popularity compared to consoles? Of course, neither can hold a candle to mobile gaming, but I would be interested in hearing your thoughts. Veil, vale, Tim. Thank you, Tim. So uh, that is a really big topic, but in general, I think that the hardware uh, limitations, the limitations and availability of computer hardware is going to affect all the other markets as well. Like it's already affecting mobile. It's already affecting uh, the next gen uh, platforms, the, uh, the consoles, uh, their availability is down. So I, I don't think it's a uniquely PC problem um, but it is interesting to to speculate on how this is going to change development. As for the PC versus console thing, 
I mean, the standard for the last 20 years is that consoles are very strong early in the console generation. And then as they get older, PCs get stronger. Like, I don't just mean stronger like... I'm not talking about processing power. I mean, like, the, the consoles will get the best titles first. And those titles will have the most marketing and the most hype and get the most attention. And then late in the console generation when the consoles are getting a little slow and a little long in the tooth all the interesting stuff will be happening on the pc and that's where all these exciting technology will be so you know people will be t be paying attention to that oh here's this new thing oh look it's ray tracing or vr or whatever is going on all of that is going to land on the pc first and so people will get excited about the PC and talk about the new stuff. And those games will get a lot of market, will get more marketing and PC ports will be of higher quality. So it's sort of like a pendulum to me. Mm -hmm. um, as for will they rein in their, their bloated game dev costs? I can't imagine. This has been going on for 20 years. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if they haven't stopped now, why would you know nothing before this has slowed them down so why would they start now yeah yeah playing, what would they playing the latest hd of? triple plus game isn't about the absolute graphics it's about how much better your computer is than that other guys right if they're going to pivot away from um graphical fidelity they need something to pivot to and they don't they've never had like uh, on the AAA level, on the management level of AAA companies, they don't really understand anything besides that, but that and story. And I, I, I think they've given up on story. So like, you know, oh, we're going to really focus on gameplay mechanics and loop and feedback loops and, and, um, depth. And no, I mean, that, that hasn't been a focus in years. If anything, games are getting dumber as more of their challenge gets taken out of the game and more it's more about paying to beat the game mm -hmm. you know pay for microtransactions and stuff and every time you add that you're taking skill out of the equation you're taking some of the skill out of it so that you can drive people to buy your stuff so like it would be weird that they start pivoting towards gameplay now that that goes against what they've been doing recently. So yeah, I even if they recognize that chasing graphical fidelity isn't really paying off, I don't think they know how to spend their money any other way. I don't think they they know how to set up other priorities other than you know a few stand out you know from software and um, other companies, Zactronics. Sure, sure, but I'm trying to think in the AAA space. Like I was going to say, oh yeah, I was gonna, I was going to name the Batman developers, but one I can't remember their name, Rocksteady. But like all of that stuff's being slowly digested by the microtransaction creature, and you know those games are are getting worse mechanically. Yeah, there's also a lot of room left for graphical improvement that doesn't require better hardware. Uh, there's a ton you can do with, with better textures, with better uh, optimization, engine optimization, with baking in lighting and light maps, um, with you know, pre-computed physics stuff. There's a ton of stuff you can do for, for making something look better that doesn't actually really require your computer to be a better computer. Like, Back in the crisis days, you know, it really was just crunching all these numbers and it was it was right at the edge of what your computer could do. But nowadays, even a mid-tier computer, and maybe it's different for crap tops. Um, in fact, I've got one that I use and it's, you know, it struggles with even playing satisfactory, right? And like, it's just not, it doesn't have the power. But even for mid-level computers, most of the graphics these days aren't, unless you're intentionally making them, aren't that difficult for the computer to process. It's it's more a matter of what kind of techniques the game designers are using to make their games look a certain way. So I, I think there there is a lot more they can do with the current hardware that people have access to. Um, I mean, there's certainly money they can spend making it better, more or less. Right.
you think about um like how the persona games i've never played a persona game but i've never seen footage of persona and not gone oh wow that looks amazing right um so yeah there's a lot you can do that isn't raw graphic it's true um also physics you mentioned physics isaac and i were talking about this last week how half-life 2 had all these wonderful physics and they were like not just part of the of the world like oh you make an explosion and stuff flies everywhere but it's also integrated into the puzzles and the combat you can like banks bank grenades around corners and stuff like that and mm -hmm. that seems to be much less of a focus these days i mean you can still do that but game developers aren't like deliberately creating scenarios where that's useful or fun like yeah i could i could stand here and try and make the perfect trick shot with a grenade you know and try and kill the guys in this little nest or i could just walk up the steps and fucking shoot everybody and it'll be like twice as fast like right and right, grenades like, are expensive right i gotta save this grenade in case i run into a boss and uh, <laughs> and that's and then just just take a whole bag of them and dump it down the boss's mouth or whatever right and of course and then it'll like do nothing to him because like <laughs> no it's a boss fight and it needs to last 10 minutes for some reason mm -hmm. so like the all the cool stuff you can do with physics games don't give you a reason to engage with them there's no more physics puzzles which i mean i know the joke at valve was oh it's the seesaw puzzle again but there was <laughs> You know, there's other stuff you can do with physics that's cool, and it just, nobody's really followed up on that, and it... Well, I mean, there's Breath of the Wild. Breath of the Wild has tons of physics puzzles. Does it? I, I haven't played that. Um, and there's Noida. There's certainly Noida is, is all about physics, Sim. Once again, like, I, I'm thinking, like, the Ubisoft games, the EA games, the Activision games, the other AAA studios, like... Their games are just hmm. run up the stairs and shoot everybody. You don't get How that. About football oh. manager. That's basically a physics sim, right? <laughs> One I physics understand. object. Right. As I understand it, football manager is actually just spreadsheet simulator. Like there is no football manager. You don't actually get to play football. It's all the what? stats. Yeah. No. Yeah. I'm serious. Look at the screenshots of the game. I've never seen one that I've, had a football. Yeah, I've never in seen it. one either. Uh, well, I've never seen one, so maybe that's that's I was I was misled the whole time. I thought it was like Madden or something. No, no, apparently it's not. That's FIFA. FIFA. Oh, okay. You play football in football. Manager. All right. Well, there you go. FIFA yeah. physics sim game. Right. There's one physics object in the whole <laughs> in the whole game. You don't have to solve the three body problem. <laughs> it's, just, it's just a ball. No, it's rounder. Um. It's, <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't I don't know. It feels like there's a bunch of stuff they could be doing with physics that they definitely are not. Remember back in the late 90s, early aughts, we had uh, this game set on Mars that had destructible environments? When was the last time we had a single-player game where you could destroy oh, yeah. walls Red as a means of... Yeah, destroy walls as a means of progression. That's not a thing anymore. Well, I mean, so, so like you said, it kind of moved into the indie space where the technology was available to indies, and so the indies are all doing fun stuff with it. Um, but it's not really a, it's not really a triple A kind of experience, I guess. Right. What was that a Star Wars game where you had the lightsaber? You could like dynamically cut stuff up with a lightsaber. I know you're not talking about Beat Saber. No, but there's there you go. It all went into VR. Yeah, job simulator. VR's got tons of physics stuff. Physics is fun in VR. Maybe it's just that we're looking at the wrong the wrong genres. Like the AAA games make games that are trying to be movies. And you don't have physics sims in movies, right? right? Like James Bond doesn't do juggling tricks or whatever. He's all explosions right. I, and shooting dudes. Right. I mean, I made all that jokes about earlier in the show about I want to play a game where I can just, you know, make the world better by killing everybody. But like I mean, that's obviously not true because P AAA studios have been doing that for for years and they're boring the hell out of me. <laughs>
they oh oh i get to shoot all these dudes but i can tell they're bad guys because they're wearing black uh yeah i just i just want to play a game where i'm playing fix it felix from wreck it ralph and i can just like fix stuff by smacking it with a hammer i guess i just want to play something that's a little more mechanically interesting where it's like yeah, I could shoot these guys if I wanted to kill them in the most boring way possible. Or I could kill them by orchestrating the destruction of the building that they're in. Blowing out the load-bearing <laughs> pillars and crushing them and all. And, you know, bringing down the building. Or burning it down. Or, or whatever, you know. Yeah, yeah. The Incredible Machine Massacre Edition. <laughs> right. <laughs> the Incredible Machine, now filled with Nazis. There you go. Because I don't want I don't want to be challenged. I just want it to feel very easy to just murder tons of people. So just tell me they're alien space aliens or Nazis or zombies or whatever, and then I can kill them without thinking about it. Wolfenstein Six: The Remarkable Contraption. <laughs> that sounds like the name of the game launcher. How do <laughs> I a description of the game launcher? You're right. How do I launch this freaking game? Okay, here I can buy some DLC or upgrade to the special gold version. But how do I launch the game? I can set up a multiplayer session. I can share. I can share my screenshots on so social media. But what part of this contraption allows me to launch the game in a single player environment? <laughs> You have to you have to get enthusiastic consent from the game before you can launch it, Seamus. Well, Paul, I feel like we've done a show. Still got some mailbags again. We're, we got a, we got in the groove. Thank you to everybody who's sending questions. Great questions this week. If you've got a question for the show, our email is diecast at SeamusYoung.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say, see you later, Paul. What? No, I can't. Yeah. Ah! <laughs> <laughs>